Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending the November 2nd installment of the PNW series on race, racism and anti-racism. Today's talk is entitled The Ethics of Protest, Gandhi, King, Mandela and the Dalai Lama. 18 months ago, this series started rather organically, driven by faculty in response to the murder of George Floyd and racialized police violence in the United States. We are dedicating this year's series to Glenn Ford, who is our inaugural speaker and a guest of Professor Lee Arts. Glenn Ford was the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report and unfortunately passed away earlier this fall. I'd like to give a special thank you to my co-presenter, Professor Deepa Majumdar, Professor of Philosophy at Purdue University Northwest. Nothing at this series could happen without Professor Majumdar's vision and tenacity. And I want to just add a special dose of gratitude to her for inviting me to partner with her on today's talk, for trusting me enough to partner with me on today's talk. So thank you, Professor Majumdar. A special thank you also to Chancellor Keon and to Provost Holford for your continued support and funding for this series. Also to Chris Falzone, to Rachel Pollack and Jamie Eggert. Thank you for all the magic you make happen behind the scenes. None of this would happen, of course, without the Dream Team, our audiovisual folks. So thank you to Greg Collins, Sharon Allen, Josiah Tipton, Brian Benjamin, and others who have been so willing to step up and help with things. And then lastly, a special thank you to Sue Brimmer in the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs office, as well as uh, Anne Gregory, who is the, serving as the interim dean of the College of Humanities, Education and Social Sciences. You've done so much to pave the way to make this fall series happen. Thank you to our audience members uh, on Zoom. It's wonderful that you've once again chosen to share an afternoon, on, um, a critical time in the afternoon, a lunch hour with us. So we thank you and we hope um, you'll take away lots from today's session. At this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Leveda Taylor. Leveda will be moderating today's session. And so we thank you for this service. Dr. Taylor is an associate professor of education in the School of Education and Counseling. Her teaching and research interests are grounded in post-colonialism, post-structuralism, and culturally responsive pedagogy. A graduate of Louisiana State University with a PhD in curriculum and instruction, Dr. Taylor also has a concentrated emphasis in curriculum theory. Dr. Taylor's research examines the experience of historical marginalized learners within the socio-political context of schooling. Her work has appeared in Educational Foundations, Educational Studies, Urban Education, Democracy in Education, and Essays in Education. Additionally, her work appears in the following books, Curriculum Studies, The Next Moment, and Race, Gender, Curriculum Theorizing. And of course, most recently, her own edited text, Implications of Race and Racism in Student Evaluations of Teaching, The Hate You Give. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much, Dr. Karen Bishop Morris. And thank you all for um, joining the series. I have the esteemed honor of introducing our speakers this afternoon. First, I will introduce Dr. Karen Bishop Morris. Dr. Karen Bishop Morris is an Associate Professor of English at PNW. She earned her PhD in Rhetoric and Composition from Purdue University, West Lafayette, where she returned in 2008 to accept the Purdue University Diversity Council Recognition Award. And again, in 2020, as the alumni speaker of the Hutton Hutton Lecture Series. She currently serves as a member of the 2020-2021 Purdue Equity Task Force, leading the team on recruitment, retention, and promotion of faculty of color. Dr. Majundar is a professor of philosophy at Purdue University Northwest. Her area of specialization is at the cusp of philosophy and theology. Besides her well-received book, Plotinus Cosmology, a republished by Rutledge in 2016, and a volume of philosophical poetry, Dr. Dr. Majundar has published several papers, mainly in peer-reviewed international journals. While her work focuses on philosophy of Plotinus and on comparative theology, 
She has also published papers on Plato and Gandhi. In addition, she has published, she has a published book chapters in anthologies and book reviews in top tier international philosophy journals. Finally, of late, she has published essays on topics as diverse as technology and the pandemic. In her spare time, Dr. Majundar loves to write and listen to traditional Indian music. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me clearly enough? Yes, is my voice uh, clear? Okay, I'm going to be I'm going to be doing the introduction to today's event, uh, and I'm going to, be sh going to be sharing a slideshow with you. So <clears throat> I'm going to do share screen. Um, so give me just one minute here to do that. Um, yeah. Okay. So. So I'm going to now um, just give me one minute to get to this, yeah. Okay, so you can see the print, right? Everyone can see it clearly. Um, if you can't necessarily read, I mean, some of the slides have a lot of uh, words in it. If you can't necessarily read everything, no worries at all because I'll be summarizing, synthesizing, commenting as we go through it. Okay, so today's event is Princes of Peace and Ethics of Protest, Gandhi King, Mandela, Dalai Lama, but the order in which we'll be doing them would be Gandhi King, yeah, is, is this order basically with Dalai Lama at the end, um, and it's part of the series Race, Racism, etc. So this is the introduction. So the first question to raise is why must protest even be ethical? And my simple answer to that is because otherwise it fails historically. And, and so not just protests, but let me add, the cause has to be ethical too. Not all protests serve ethical causes. Um, so here are some signs of failure. Violence, heightened subjectivity, and delusion. By heightened subjectivity, I mean when the accusation, like racist, for example, or sexist, becomes hugely subjective. Um, another sign of failure is creation or the desire to create a dystopic kind of utopia very subjective utopia. A third sign of failure is short-term gains with no long-term benefits. And the sum result is that revolutions then as a result revolve from one node of injustice to another, always missing the balance of justice. Movements fail when they aim at power rather than social justice. I know there's a lot of talk of power these days, but power and strength are two different things. Movements fail when they allow mental and physical violence towards people and things. When they, and here I'm borrowing from Gandhi, when they let the ends or the consequences dictate the means used. And finally, when they use strategies that degenerate to mere expediency with no moral guidance. Even in the world of finance, uh, which is hugely strategic, you need some moral principles. Technology may be the only realm where you can be purely strategic, but in politics, definitely they have to be, the moral has to take, um, in the hierarchy, the moral has to take precedence over the strategic. Movements succeed when they transform the collective consciousness through inspiration, not indoctrination. So my first conclusion here is that in order to succeed morally and historically, protest movements must be ethical, meaning nonviolent, avoiding power, aiming at justice, prioritizing means over ends. So the first aspect I'm going to look at is enmity. And there are two types of enmity, political enmity, which is different from personal enmity. Political enmity is more distant and detached. It applies to a group, labeled the group enemy. Um, it runs the risk of hate-based generalizations about the enemy. That's just a risk that's, that's there that should be, uh, you know, one should be vigilant about. Um, in personal enmity, nonviolence is a, is a moral high ground, even if it's not always feasible. Political enmity, one would think, would be naturally and easily more nonviolent because it's more detached and distant, but reality tells us otherwise. In political enmity, nonviolence is infeasible when, number one, the enemy is disproportionately armed. You couldn't have used nonviolence, I believe. I don't think Gandhian methods would have worked in Nazi Germany or in Tibet when PRC um, invaded Tibet, or more recently in, in <clears throat> Afghanistan against the Taliban. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but that's, I do believe uh, there has to be a reality check there. And nonviolence is also infeasible and morally wrong in a way where the activist is not morally mature enough to force 
uh, an activist to be nonviolent when they're not yet ready for it is it can never be true nonviolence. Even so, meaning even though nonviolence is not always feasible, the ideal of nonviolence matters because it gives us something to aspire towards. The highest teachings on nonviolence come from Christ and the Buddha. So Christ tells us to turn the other cheek, not resist evil, pray for and love our enemies, do good to and bless those who hate and curse us, etc. And Christ could not only say this, but demonstrate this because he was Christ. The Buddha reminds us that hate cannot dispel hatred, only love can. This is because a vice like hatred can be quelled only by its matching virtue like love and nothing else. This is the logic and ethics of protest. The ideal of nonviolence has two levels. At the lower level, you have forgiveness of the enemy. At the higher level, you have love or compassion for the enemy. Here's the rationale. The enemy needs moral rescuing more than the oppressed. The oppressed person is oppressed, but is not morally, um, is not morally declining. The enemy, on the other hand, is morally declining through the abuse and the enmity that he or she practices. So this rescuing or redeeming happens through loving the enemy. Love for the enemy redeems more powerfully than any other love. It converts the heart of the enemy. Loving the enemy therefore makes sense morally and practically because it detoxifies the enemy and diffuses enmity. So here are some conclusions. Ethical activists will be rare because only a few souls are ready for these highest teachings. But unlike ordinary revolutionaries, they shake the foundations of history. Someone like Gandhi, our four princes of peace, they really shake history in its foundations. The fact that nonviolence is not always feasible does not make it useless. Nonviolence serves as a guiding light. Nonviolence means loving the enemy or taking responsibility for his moral decline. Um, nonviolence does not mean passivity. Today, outrage is the norm. But anger is wrong, not only morally, but also practically because, because it weakens the activist. Detachment, which comes from love for the enemy is far better. The spectator is therefore the best actor. So we see this in the Buddha who on the one hand says, all beings tremble before violence, see yourself in other, then whom can you hurt? Yet also warns with a kind of divine wrath that he who harms the harmless or hurts the innocent 10 times shall he fall into torment or infirmity, injury or desire or, or disease or, or madness. Meaning that even the Buddha <clears throat> who was such a gentle soul could yet be as powerful as lightning in his assumed wrath, the divine wrath that he uses to warn those who harm the harm, the, the most wicked kind of, of harming one can do. So ethical protest begins with nonviolent defiance of injustice and non-cooperation with unjust laws and actions. This calls for self-discipline based on self-purification, which both Gandhi and King, and maybe the others too really called for. The Dalai Lama is, was a monk and, and Mandela during his prison years in particular, they had to do a lot of reflecting, I'm sure. So they really had to work on themselves first. Um, politics and religion normally explode when you mix them uh, at lower levels. So theocracies typically don't work. But politics and religion mingle very well at higher levels because higher religiosity ennobles politics. Most of our princes of peace were inspired by religion. So nonviolence, in my humble view, remains the most effective way of changing history. So this is where the first, um, first introduction ends. And I'm now going to move on to a, a PowerPoint presentation on Gandhi. Um, so bear with me a little longer. And if you have any, um, any, any chat comments or questions, please post them on the chat and they'll be collected at the end and rest assured your questions will be answered. Okay, so I'm going to share screen on the, on the, Gandhi, um, on the Gandhi presentation. And again, it'll be a slideshow. So um, I'm not sure why it didn't start at the beginning. Yeah, so, so let's start here with Gandhi. And many of you may have heard of Gandhi already, but in case you haven't, um, his full name is Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. And the dates for him are 1869 to 1948. Who was he? He was actually originally a lawyer by practice and, and a loyal citizen of the British Empire. He was not political to begin with, okay? But 
that's that's where I think history chooses these these um, you know mega figures of of protest. Um, uh, he became the nonviolent leader of India's independence movement for freedom from British colonialism, and he was deeply, profoundly religious. He admired Christ very, very much. Um, so, what does Gandhi see on enmity? He says to begin with that it's easy enough to be friendly to one's friends, but to befriend the one who regards himself as your enemy is the quintessence of true religion. The other is mere business, meaning being friends with someone who's friendly with you is just wheeling and dealing. And, and today we're not even capable of that. The human relations have become so frail. But loving the enemy is, is the heart of true religion. And that's really a much stronger, much more powerful form of friendship. Um, and so um, he also says, conquer the heart of the enemy with truth and love, not by violence. Um, and then he, but that takes a, a great soul. He says, love is a rare herb that makes a friend even of a sworn enemy, and this herb grows out of nonviolence. So you can see how he's connecting love for the enemy with nonviolence here. He says, no man could look upon another as his enemy unless he first became his own enemy, meaning you betray yourself when you see another person as an enemy. It is the acid test of nonviolence that in a nonviolent conflict, there is no rancor left behind. And in the end, the enemies are converted into friends. Look at his faith in human nature. <clears throat> and again, it takes somebody of his stature to be able to practice that. Um, speaking from my own experience, I think loving the enemy is a very difficult kind of love. Um, so the conclusions are loving the enemy is not only moral, but also practical. Why? Because love diffuses the hatred of the enemy, converting his heart and removing enmity. So loving the enemy serves not just the enemy, but also the oppressed. Um, so moving on then to Gandhi on nonviolence. Um, here are a few typical standard Gandhian terms. The first is ahimsa, which means nonviolence. The second is satyagraha, which is truth force or the strength that comes from truthfulness. The satyagrahi is the practitioner of satyagraha. And Gandhi's larger point was that the enemy is going to be equipped with weapons, etc. We have just one weapon, and that is satyagraha, the power of truth. Truthfulness is our only weapon. Uh, and and he, like I said, among his his um, his ideals was Christ. So you could, I mean, he because he grew up in colonized India, he was not very patient with Christians necessarily because they were on the conversion mission, mission and, and a colonial mission. But that didn't stop him from loving and adoring Christ. Um, so Gandhi demonstrated nonviolence before the armed enemy through nonviolent direct action. For example, the Salt March of 1930. And here, here's going to, I'm going to just uh, share a quote with you from Horace Alexander, who was an English Quaker pacifist and friend of Gandhi, who witnessed Gandhi in action and describes the attitude of the nonviolent resistor to his opponent. Here's the quote, he's from Horace Al Alexander. He says, on your side, you have all the mighty forces of the modern state, arms, money, a controlled press and all the rest. On my side, I have nothing but my conviction of right and truth the unquenchable spirit of man who is prepared to die for his convictions then submit to your brute force. I have my comrades in armlessness. Here we stand and here, if need be, we fall. Um, I have another quote to show that it was not just Gandhi, but Gandhians as well who demonstrated nonviolence in action against an armed enemy. Gandhi's salt protest at Dharasana Salt Works India on May 21st, 1930 took place without his presence because he was jailed. American journalist Webb Miller describes the British response. Um, so Webb Miller says, in complete silence, the Gandhi men drew up and halted a hundred yards from the stockade. A picked column advanced from the crowd, waded the ditches and approached the barbed wire stockade. At a word of command, scores of native policemen rushed upon the advancing marches and rained blows on their heads with their steel shot lattes. A latte is a long bamboo stick. Not one of the mar marches even raised an arm to fend off blows. They went down like nine pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening whack of clubs on unprotected skulls. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious or writhing with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. Um, so here are some Gandhi quotes for nonviolence. But before I get into that, let me just clarify one thing that struck me last night, which is the huge difference between the nonviolent 
you know, resistor and the suicide uh, bomber who's willing to, both are willing to die, but in completely two different ways. The suicidal bomber is, suicide bomber is a homicidal suicidal person, absolutely violent. The nonviolent votary of Gandhi, on the other hand, is somebody who's willing to sacrifice his life for the principle of nonviolence, big difference there. So here are some Gandhi quotes for nonviolence, and then, then I'll share some quotes against nonviolence. Man for man, he says, the strength of nonviolence is an exact proportion to the ability, not the will, of the nonviolent person to inflict violence. In, in other words, in short, you can't call a person nonviolent if they can't even be violent. They have to, in the first place, be capable of violence, but control themselves. Gandhi had a great disdain for people whom he called impotent and, 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 and cowards. Uh, who run away are incapable of even striking back. So nonviolence applies to the person who can strike back but chooses not, chooses not to. The power at the disposal of a nonviolent person is always greater than he would have if he were violent. That the, by power, he means strength here, not, not uh, desire to dominate. There is no such thing as defeat in nonviolence. It, meaning ahimsa or nonviolence, is the only true force in life. It's a force. Further quotes for nonviolence. Nonviolence is not a garment to be put on and off at will. Its seat is in the heart and it must be an inseparable part of our being. In other words, it's not something seasonal. The sword of the satyagrahi, that is one who practices truth force, is love and the unshakable firmness that comes from love. In nonviolence, the bravery consists in dying, not in killing. And it's to this quote that I would apply my point about the difference between the votary of nonviolence and the suicide bomber, completely different. Gandhi also is against nonviolence. So he's not, he's not a fanatic for nonviolence. He understands that violence sometimes happens. He says it's better to be violent if there's violence in our hearts than to put on the cloak of nonviolence to cover impotence. Violence is any day preferable to impotence. There is hope for a violent man to become nonviolent, no such hope for the impotent, but meaning those who are morally lazy, lethargic, and unwilling to do anything. He also says he who cannot protect himself or his nearest and dearest or their honor by nonviolently facing death may and ought to do so by violently dealing with the oppressor. He who can do neither of the two is a burden. So here he has the activists um, you know, claim upon the world that you have to do something in the face of injustice. Um, I'm a little more laid back than Gandhi. I do believe that not everybody is in a situ literal life situation to protest and nobody should be, not everybody should be asked to do so. Uh, but that's, you know, up to you, each one of us, how we think about it. Gandhi quotes against nonviolence continued. He says, if the people, and this is where he's showing his pragmatism, if the people are not ready for the exercise of the nonviolence of the brave, they must be ready for the use of force and self-defense. There should be no camouflage. It must never be secret. So he's very clear that self-defense is legitimate. Injustice must be resisted. No doubt the nonviolent way is always the best, but where that does not come naturally, the violent way is both necessary and honorable. People sometimes don't know that Gandhi also endorsed violence. Inaction here is rank, cowardice, and unmanly. It must be shunned at all cost. So he's very much against cowardice. Um, so here are my conclusions. Both Gandhi and Gandhians personally demonstrated nonviolence before the armed enemy. Gandhi championed nonviolence as a triumph over life and over our animal instincts. He championed nonviolence as a sign of supreme strength, but he also endorsed violence as being better than inaction and impotence, rejecting the impotent coward who hides behind the cloak of nonviolence. So this is where I end and um, I'm gonna stop share here and hand over to Dr. my colleague, Dr. Karen Bishop Morris, uh, who's now going to take over and speak on King and, and Mandela. Thank you so much for listening. You, <laughs> so give me just a second here. So I'm sharing my screen now. And it's wonderful to be able to, again, talk about these two exemplars of 
um, ethical protest, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and Mandela. So this is Michael King Jr. He was born on January 15, 1929, and his father, Michael King Sr., was the senior pastor of um, Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church. In 1934, the senior King actually traveled to Germany and became inspired by the teachings of the Protestant Reformation leader, Martin Luther. And upon his return, and as a result of that inspiration, he changed his own name, as well as the name of his five-year-old son. And that's how we end up with Martin Luther King Jr. Scholars agree that Martin Luther King Jr., pictured here, was not a scholar of Lutheranism. However, make no mistake, um, that there was influence. Perhaps the German monk's courage to stand up and push for church reformation inspired King's own fearlessness as he pushed for racial and social justice. This next slide is actually a map of India. So Gandhi and uh, Dr. King actually never met. However, Dr. King did take a pilgrimage to India in uh, 1959. He was gone for about a month, and this map depicts his travels um, and the stops that he made. Um, King was a, a really heavy-duty intellectual. Um, he earned his degree from in sociology from Morehouse College and graduated at the age of 19. Um, from there, he entered divinity school Penn's Crozer Theological Seminary, and then he attended graduate school at Boston University, where he received his PhD in 1955. He actually wrote his dissertation on two uh, philosophers and theologians, and he often quoted Tillich, who was one of them, who said that the first duty of love is to listen. And in that quote alone, we can see some of the early traces of the compassion and empathy that characterized King. So back to the kings and their pilgrimage to India, this photo actually shows the uh, Coretta Scott King and Dr. King um, at the airport. Um, no, actually, this is them at the airport uh, in New Delhi, where they're actually flanked by Gandhi's associates. Again, remember, um, he never met Gandhi in person, but the relationship between Gandhi's associates and the King family um, exists until today. So here are the kings at the home of independence leader uh, J.B. Kripalani. In fact, when the kings were traveling throughout India, Nehru was the prime minister at the time. Um, and so here he is at the home of Kripalani. This is the kings actually laying a wreath on Gandhi's samadhi. So this is the site of Gandhi's cremation and last rites, uh, which actually took place on the 31st of January in 1948, one day after Gandhi's assassination. And of course, we know that that is, as we're talking about these princes of peace, that is one thing that Gandhi and King share in common. Unfortunately, they were both assassinated. So that relationship is very much a reciprocal one. So um, King visits uh, with, with Gandhi associates in India and Gandhi's associates uh, traveled to Montgomery and to Atlanta to visit with King. And this picture is showing um, one of Gandhi's associates in Montgomery. I like to share this photograph and, and you may have seen me share it in other places because this is actually uh, C.T. Vivian, who was also a civil rights leader and also a minister and a close friend of Dr. King, teaching a class in nonviolence. Um, we actually lost C.T. Vivian in 2020. Uh, he passed away in Atlanta. But what I like folks to do is really to pay attention to the, to the inclusivity here uh, depicted by this photograph. In the photo, you can see um, Jewish men, you can see Catholic nuns, you can see whites, blacks, Latinos, old folks, young folks. Um, so the movement uh, was actually very much a, an exemplar of inclusivity. So how does King get to nonviolence? Um, some folks know that it is sort of my personal mission for folks to really understand and appreciate Dr. King for more than just, I have a dream and the letter from Birmingham jail, but to really understand the depth of his intellect and um, 
and scholarly pursuits. And so this is sort of, this slide is tracing how he arrived at adopting nonviolence as the hallmark of the civil rights movement. So he actually credits reading Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience as his first intellectual contact with the theory of nonviolent resistance. And he was so fascinated by the idea of folks refusing to cooperate with an evil system that he says in many places that he reread the essay on civil disobedience many times. When King entered the Crozer theological ceremony is when he began a serious sort of intellectual, what he calls quest for a method to eliminate social evil. And it's there that he encountered many texts, Rochambeau's Christianity and the Social Crisis. He studied Plato and Aristotle, then Rousseau and Hobbes, Bentham Mill, Locke, so many. Um, so with Rosenbosch, he didn't agree with him wholesale. He thought that he came close to identifying the kingdom of God with a particular social and economic system. And King felt that religion should be concerned with social and economic systems, but not to the extent of being overly material. Um, so he never quite departed entirely from Rosenbosch, but um, there were uh, some differences there. In 1949, uh, King picked up, and this is, I always think a pretty funny story. He actually picked up uh, Karl Marx and read uh, Das Kapital and the Communist Man Manifesto. And in his book, uh, Stride Toward Freedom, he talks about spending his Christmas holiday in 1949, reading and rereading Marx, and as well as interpretive works on Marx and Lenin. Um, of course, we know that King rejected communism outright. He thought it was too secular and too materialistic. He also, of course, disagreed with the fact that uh, communism sort of moved forward this idea of a divine government and uh, sort of away from, there was no divine government or absolute moral order uh, with anything. And so, um, King's interpretation was that murder and lying and any means sort of justify the ends. And so obviously um, he didn't agree with that. And then the rest of this slide um, talks about, again, just shows how his thinking on nonviolence developed. He read Nietzsche, he studied Gandhi and uh, Professor Majumdar talked about this concept of truth equaling love plus force. And then um, leaving a uh, seminary um, he was a, became acquainted with the works of Niebuhr on social ethics and pacifist positions. Here are the six principles of nonviolence. So these are the principles that are extant today. Um, if you visit the website of the King Center or if you hear uh, uh, Reverend Bernice King, his daughter, speaking about or teaching about the principles of nonviolence, these are the principles that um, still uphold not only the civil rights movement, but the pursuit of the King Center and others for racial justice. So let's take them kind of one by one. Um, and, and I should say this, for King, Gandhi was really the first person in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above the mere interaction between individuals. So for for. King, he took from Gandhi that it's more about just interacting with, with individuals, but that love was such a powerful social force that it really could, and on a large scale, transform community and transform society. Um, so here are the six principles. Let's take them quickly. So principle number one, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. So King said that nonviolence, and again, he's taking this ex verbatim from Gandhi, is not a method for cowards. It does resist. If one uses the method of nonviolence because he is afraid or because he lacks the instruments of violence, then he is not truly nonviolent. This is why Gandhi often said that if cowardice is the only alternative to violence, then yes, it is better to fight. And he made that statement conscious of the fact that there is always another alternative. No individual or group need to submit to anything wrong, nor need they, nor need they use violence to right the wrong. There is always a way for nonviolent resistance. So in reading this principle, 
this is not passivity, nor is it passive resistance. This principle is not advocating for doing nothing. It's just saying that the resistor is passive physically, but there is always active stuff happening with the resistor's mind and emotions. The method is passive physically, but strong actively uh, spiritually. So here's our second principle of nonviolence. Nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. So in other words, nonviolence does not concern itself with defeating or humiliating an opponent. Actually, it's quite the opposite. The objective of nonviolence where personal relationships are concerned is to win over the friendship of the oppressor and to actually come to some understanding and common ground. We see this and we'll see this in a minute with King's first boycott um, and protest, resisting through boycotts and other sort of non-physical protests. These are in, these are not ends, but rather means to awaken a sense of moral shame in one's opponent. And King, for King, he always believed that the end was redemption and reconciliation. Principle number three speaks to nonviolence seeking to defeat injustice, not people. And so this principle directly addresses injustice or evil. Um, this is not about uh, black hating white, but this is rather about hating injustice, not people. Again, we'll see this play out when we talk about King's first protest, the Montgomery boycott, and how he characterized tensions between oppressors and resistors. Principle number four, nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. So, this is a quote from Gandhi, actually. Rivers of blood may have to flow before we gain our freedom, but it must be our blood. The nonviolent resistor is willing to accept violence if necessary, but never to inflict it. He does not seek to dodge jail. If going to jail is necessary, he enters it as a bridegroom enters the bride's chamber. So King anticipated our reluctance to accept this, this sort of mass political application of this ancient doctrine of turning the other cheek, you know, to what end? How do we justify this? Um, and so uh, Gandhi for King was again the answer. Things of fundamental importance to people are not secured by reason alone, but have to be purchased with their suffering. So in other words, suffering was infinitely more powerful than just the law of the jungle for converting the opponent um, and opening his ears. There actually must be some skin in the game, so to speak. Principle number five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. So nonviolence avoids outward physical demonstrations of violence and hate, and just as importantly, inward or internal violence of spirit. So it's not okay to walk around sort of secretly um, um, hating, uh, but um, we have to really have a clean uh, and pure heart outwardly and, as well as inwardly. So in the words of King, the nonviolent resistor not only refuses to shoot his or her opponent, but she or he also refuses to hate him. In the struggle for human dignity, the nonviolent resistor cannot succumb to becoming bitter or indulging in hate campaigns, lest our retaliation in kind intensify the existence of hatred in the world. King said, quote, someone along the way must have the decency and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate. And this can only be done by projecting an ethic of love to the center of our lives. And in his book, King gets into a really deep discussion um, here of love. So he turns to the Greek language to come to our aid, right? He dismisses Eros by choosing love. He's not talking about what we have come to define as romantic love, nor is he talking about philia or the intimate affection between friends, that kind of reciprocal love, but rather he's talking about the love here that we know as agape. Right, agape is a disinterested love in which the individual seeks not his own good, but the good of his neighbor. It begins with loving people for their own sake. There is no distinction between friend and, and, and enemy. It springs from the need of the other person, his need, the oppressor's need, 
to belong, to be the best and to belong to the human family. Um, King actually thought that if you work against community, you're working against the whole of creation. And he said, if I meet hate with hate, I become depersonalized, but creation is so designed that my personality can only be fulfilled in the context of community. And then the last principle of nonviolence. Nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. One who subscribes and adheres to the philosophy of nonviolence, according to King, must have deep faith in the future. And so that's why we see even um, devout believers in nonviolence who doubt their belief in a personal God, but even still, those non-believers often speak of a creative force in the universe that works to bring together disconnected aspects of reality for the common good. So here, I wanna stop share for just a second and then share again. I have a really brief video that I will play of the Montgomery bus boycott, so. Thank you for your patience. Three hundred and eighty-two days. That's a long time. Can you imagine how empowered people felt? It's like, we did what? The Montgomery bus boycott says to the nation that segregation is no longer the blow of the land and that the formula for attacking segregation in all of its facets is going to be nonviolent civil disobedience on one hand and litigation on the other. The boycott was one of the greatest examples of civic engagement of the 20th century. Sorry, not sure what happened there. One second, we'll go back to it. I probably moved something. All right. Well, it wouldn't be technology if we didn't have a, a snap. All right. So in Montgomery, we'll, Alabama. The man that should sit in the black only section in an almost empty bus. When she talked to other women in the Women's Political Council about this episode, she found out that they had similar experiences. There were a number of arrests in 1955 of Black women who were violating the segregation ordinance on the buses. And on the night of December 1st, when Rosa Parks was arrested, Joanne Robinson springs into action and they actually execute this plan to, to initiate a bus boycott. At the time, most people rode the bus to kind of get around. There weren't as many cars in the world. So you begin to realize that if we don't ride the buses, you know, we are able to kind of break the system to a great degree. Joanne Robinson comes on campus late that night with a couple of students, runs off 50,000 flyers. The next morning, between classes, they pass out these flyers. She calls the civil rights attorney, Fred Gray. She calls E.B. Nixon, labor organizer, really the recognized leader of Black Montgomery. And they decide to endorse the boycott. They organize the Montgomery Improvement Association to execute and to coordinate the activities surrounding the Montgomery bus boycott. And they select this newcomer, Martin Luther King, to head up the Montgomery Improvement Association. Martin Luther King weaves into Montgomery ideas about love and civil disobedience, overcoming adversity. And the people of Montgomery were willing not only to listen, but to act on this. I was the NAACP Youth Council president and I participated in the boycott. I walked to school and we just saw the empty buses go by because there were no black people on them. At the time that this movement began here, we had about 50,000 African-Americans living in Montgomery. 
and they were pretty close to 50,000 black people who worked together during this bus boycott. We stayed off the buses and found other ways to get to where we needed to go. And so they bought station wagons and they had an actual boot, just like buses have routes. For several weeks, I was a volunteer driver every day going out and just hauling people to work or to school. So people just didn't walk. They rode, but they rode in a system that they created. 382 days. That's a long time. Can you imagine how empowered people felt? It's like, we did what? The Montgomery bus boycott says to the nation that segregation is no longer the blow of the land and that the formula for attacking segregation in all of its facets is going to be nonviolent civil disobedience on one hand and litigation on the other. The boycott was one of the greatest examples of civic engagement of the 20th century. Thank you for your patience with that. Okay, we'll go back to the slides now. So the Montgomery bus boycott was so important for a number of reasons. Well, first of all, it was the earliest mass protest for civil rights in America. Very clearly, it elevated King to the national spotlight as the leader of the civil rights movement. And I think sometimes we forget, I mean, 1955 to 1968, his assassination was sort of the extent of King leading the movement, but it also solidified King's adherence to nonviolent principles. Thirdly, it brought national and international attention to the civil rights struggle in the US. And we'll see sort of the same tactic and strategy that was so effective in Mandela's life in ending apartheid. And then shortly thereafter, King and his followers founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was a very influential organization that worked to end segregation in the South. So I'll, I'll try to be quick and talk a little bit about Mandela. Um, so Nelson Mandela was born in 1918. We lost him in 2013. He was a member of the African National Congress Party beginning in the 1940s. He led peaceful and armed protests in a racially divided South Africa. We'll talk about that in just a second. What we know most often is that he was imprisoned for 27 years and also that he was the first black president of South Africa serving from 1994 to 1999. A lot of what I'm going to talk about um, is actually based on um, a book that was written about Mandela by Richard Stengel, who was a former editor of, of Time magazine, but also served as Under Secretary of State under President Obama. So um, a little about Mandela's childhood. He was born into a, a royal family of Zosha speaking people. And his father was actually chief of the village. He was a distant father and he died when Mandela was just nine years old. He was raised by a high ranking Thimbu uh, member uh, who groomed Mandela for a role in tribal leadership, but that uh, ultimately was not to happen. Mandela was a first generation student, so to speak. He was the first in his family to receive a formal education, first at a local missionary school and later at a boarding school where he actually excelled in boxing as well as academics. One might say that Mandela's taste for protest was actually awakened when he was at university. He entered an elite university in 1939 and he was actually sent home for participating in a boycott against university policies. Mandela helped lead the African National Congress and in 1952 their campaign for the defiance of unjust laws. Um, he actually led and organized protests against discriminatory policies. He promoted the Freedom Charter and in 1952 he and his childhood friend also opened South Africa's first black law firm. This he has in common with King using the law as a strategy and a tool. To students, I want to say, and I know there are some students on today, that the ANC's protests 
uh, were an outgrowth of a platform that was first articulated by the Youth League of the African National Congress. And so students, you have a voice, you have power. In 1956, Mandela and 155 other activists were arrested and put on trial for treason. Even though all defendants were acquitted, tensions grew within the African National Congress and a more militant faction spun off, the Pan-Africanist Congress. In 1962, police opened fire on peaceful Black protesters in Sharpeville. 69 peaceful protesters were killed and riots ensued. The ANC and the PAC were banned by the apartheid government. Mandela and his supporters were forced to go underground. And it was then that he decided that something other than passive resistance was necessary. So this is Man Mandela on nonviolence, uh, right? And sort of shows the change and the evolution of his character and spirit. It, was, it would be wrong and unrealistic for African leaders to continue preaching peace and nonviolence at a time when the government, government met our peaceful demands with force. It was only when all else had failed, when all channels of peaceful protest had been barred to us that the decision was made to embark on violent forms of political struggle. Some years later at the trial, when Mandela was sentenced to life imprisonment, this is a quote he made, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which all persons live, which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Mandela spent the first 18 of his 27 years in jail at Robben Island. In fact, this is a photograph of him visiting Robben Island, his prison cell many years later. Um, he was confined to a very small cell and he was a, a pretty large man. He was 6'2", but his cell did not have a bed or plumbing and he was sentenced to hard labor. Um, as a black prisoner, he received fewer rations and less privileges than white inmates. And he was only allowed to see his wife, Winnie, at the time, every six months. He was also subjected to many cruel, cruel um, punishments. Um, so just to sum this up, uh, what happened? So he was imprisoned 18 years at Robben Island. In 82, he was moved uh, to the mainland to Polesmore prison. In 88, he was placed under house arrest at a minimum security facility. And in 1989, F.W. de Klerk lifted the ban on the ANC and called for a non-racist South Africa. In 1990, de Klerk ordered Mandela's release. De Klerk and Mandela earned the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993. In 1994, more than 22 million South Africans cast ballots in the country's first multiracial elections in history. Mandela was victorious and became the first black president of South Africa and de Klerk became his first deputy. I'll end here with just a few lessons on leadership from Nelson Mandela. Um, and there were quite a few. So one is quitting his leadership too. Right. Mandela believed that um, he probably could have been president for life, but he understood that his role was setting the course. Um, and in, in one year after his election, actually, he remarked that when his term was up, he would be 80 years old and that an octogenarian should not be meddling in politics. So I think there's a takeaway there. Um, sometimes we have to know when to say no, and we also have to know when to quit. Uh, another lesson. It's a long game. Right. Um, racism. And, and I'm quoting Stengel actually here on Mandela, racism incubated over a millennia, colonialism over centuries, apartheid was created over decades. None of it can be eradicated in a few months or even a few years. Being fast doesn't make one bold. And you should know that Mandela was a very measured person. He was able to change his mind and deeply held views, but always because um, he was constantly, like King, like uh, Gandhi, educating himself and, and really thinking and playing the long game. It's always both. So there are no simple answers to, to complex questions, and there are many examples of this. 
of Mandela, not choosing either or, but always thinking that, um, you know, yes, nonviolence to a point, at some point, you know, peaceful, peaceful resistance doesn't work. And, uh, you know, armed resistance was, was the answer. His response to many complex questions in life was always, why not both? And then lastly, find your own garden. I think this is such an important message. As Stengel puts it, Mandiba's garden was a place where he could both lose himself and find himself. In, in prison, Mandela tended a garden. It was very dirty, it was rocky, no one believed anything would grow. And he wrote long letters home and people thought this he was being metaphorical. Later in life, he said, no, I was just writing and describing my garden. But he wrote to his wife and his children about the garden, about seasons. And when he was moved to Polesmore, he got a much better plot of land and he actually began supplying the entire kitchen every Sunday with vegetables. In cultivating his garden, Mandela reconnected with his childhood in a way that um, he could sow and reap and reflect on, on life. And so you must find your own garden is sort of the lesson I'll leave us with from Mandela. How do we get there from here in terms of nonviolence? Step one, we have to gather information. Step two, we have to educate others as well as educating ourselves and remain committed to the cause, right? Whatever that cause may be. But all of the um, ethical protesters that we've talked about thus far have been students. They've been students of law, students of history, students of philosophy and theology. Step four, and, and these are really taken from King's sort of ideas about moving to nonviolence. Negotiate peacefully with our oppressors. Take action, but take action peacefully. And finally, we have to be willing to reconcile. Um, you know, this idea of turning the other cheek is not about cowardice or powerlessness, but absolutely about uh, moving forward and strengthening communities. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Majumdar to end with Dalai Lama. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Bishop Morris. And I'm very cognizant of the time because we do want to leave uh, time to answer your questions. So I will try and make sure I leave enough time for that. And so I'm going to start with, uh, uh, let me just share screen first on my presentation. It'll be a slideshow again, uh, but this time on the Dalai Lama. And so <clears throat> you can see this. And so I'm going to do, a slideshow here. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure why it's not starting from the beginning. Um, so, so yeah. So let's begin with with the first um, slide, which is and in some information on the Dalai Lama, because I'm not going to assume that everybody knows who he is. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, is unique in the four, uh, among the four princes of peace because he is a monk. He is a Buddhist monk, um, so and he's the leader of the Tibetan people, um, plus the retired political leader uh, of the Tibetan government in, in exile, which he started. So the Dalai Lama has faced formidable enmity from the People's Republic of China. Um, it's a different kind of racism that he's faced brown on brown racism, but I don't know that he's faced direct personal violence like Gandhi did uh, and others did. So PRC invaded Tibet in 1950-51, where it committed horrific violations of human rights, torture, etc. Fearing for his life, the Dalai Lama fled to India in 1959, where he has since then lived in exile. From India, he has served his people tirelessly, comforting Tibetans abused by PRC, negotiating with PRC for a middle way for Tibet and maintaining the Tibetan culture. A committed pacifist, he has advocated for a nuclear free world, a Buddhist saint and an activist committed to democracy. He is the only one of our princes of peace still living. Time magazine named him one of the children of Gandhi. Although he has not personally faced violence, the Dalai Lama remains an ideal activist who refuses to hate the enemy. So what does he say on enmity? He says first, for a practitioner of love and compassion, an enemy is one of the most important teachers. Without an enemy, you cannot practice tolerance. Without tolerance, you, you cannot build a sound basis of compassion. So he doesn't just speak of loving the enemy, he considers the enemy to be a teacher, a spiritual teacher. 
If you can cultivate the right attitude, your enemies are your best spiritual teachers because their presence provides you with the opportunity to enhance and develop tolerance, patience, and understanding. Um, you can imagine the kind of respect one has to have for the enemy to regard the enemy as a teacher. Our enemies provide us with a precious opportunity to practice patience and love. We should have gratitude towards them. Think of the large heartedness here. Instead of hatred, we should have gratitude towards them. The compassion we feel normally is biased and mixed with attachment. Uh, so here, just a quick word on compassion. Compassion is not a feeling. I think in, in uh, popular culture, compassion is seen as just a feeling of, of kindness towards others, but feelings and emotions are very um, you know, explosive. They're not really reliable. Compassion is more what Aristotle would consider a whole state of being. Um, and it's very egalitarian. I, I wouldn't trust a compassion uh, that is uh, selective. Genuine compassion flows, he says, genuine compassion flows towards all living beings, particularly your enemies. If I try to develop compassion towards my enemy, it may not benefit him directly. He may not even be aware of it. Dalai Lama is being very humble here. I do believe, though, that compassion uh, redeems the heart of the enemy, but it will immediately benefit me by calming my mind. Here he sounds like the Stoics speaking of how the real enemy is within us. On the other hand, if I dwell on how awful everything is, I immediately lose my peace of mind. So the source, very stoic here, the source of peace is within us, so also the source of war and the real enemy is within us, not outside. Like the Stoics, his point is that you can't control the external world, you can control yourself. The source of war is not the existence of nuclear weapons or other arms, it's the minds of human beings who decide to push the button and to use those arms out of hatred, anger, or, or greed. Today we have so, so many complex socio-political analyses which are all very, very exteriorized. That's sort of characteristic of Western scholarship. It's very detached from the self and the self has been reduced to identity. Um, anger and hatred are the real enemies, he says, that we must confront and defeat, not the enemies who appear from time to time in our lives. So here are the conclusions. The human enemy is a teacher who teaches us virtues like patience, genuine compassion flows equally to all, especially the enemy. Real enemies within us, our own passions, anger and hatred, and the long-term solution to enmity is therefore self-control and dispassion. So what does he say on nonviolence? Compassion and love constitute nonviolence in action. They are the source of all spiritual qualities, forgiveness, tolerance, all the virtues. They give meaning to our activities and make them constructive. There is nothing amazing about being rich or highly educated. Only when the individual has a warm heart do these attributes become uh, worthwhile. And he mentions education too here because a lot of our Western, you know, modern Western education today is becoming increasingly utilitarian and practical instead of idealistic and, and moral. Um, so and 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 so it's and more psychological than philosophical. So I think this is a astute kind of observation here. Although violence and the use of force may appear powerful and decisive, their benefits are short-lived. Violence can never bring a lasting and long-term solution to any problem because it is unpredictable and for every problem it seems to solve, others are created. On the other hand, truth remains constant and will ultimately prevail. I consider nonviolence to be compassion in action. It doesn't mean weakness, cowering in fear or doing nothing. It is to act without violence, motivated by compassion, recognizing the rights of others. World peace must, must develop from inner peace. Peace is not just mere absence of violence. It is the manifestation of human compassion. He sees peace as something positive and not absence of violence. Through violence, you may solve one problem, but you sow the seeds for another. Both Gandhi and Dalai Lama recognize that violence sometimes brings short-term solutions. But the Dalai Lama goes further and says, but you're creating a new problem by acting violent. Refraining from harm, not out of fear, but out of concern for others, their well-being and out of respect is nonviolence. So you can see how he's refining the definition of nonviolence. So here are my conclusions that nonviolence is better morally and practically. It is love and compassion in action. It leads to other spiritual virtues. Violence may bring benefits in the short run, but not in the long run. Um, nonviolence is neither weakness nor impotence. Violence leads to further problems, even if it solves um, the first, uh, this can be seen in the, in the cycles of revolutions from one node of injustice to the next and the next. 
Um, imagine the kind of self-control one needs to not react in so-called legitimate anger when provoked by violence. These days, people are offended so easily. Um, this is because we have huge egos. Nonviolence calls for utter humility in the act activist. So this is where I end. I'm sorry I had to rush through a little bit, but that's because I wanted to leave time for your questions and comments, and I wanted to do things such that we end in a timely manner. So if you have questions, please, this is the time to raise them. Um, you can post them in chat or you can raise them um, and, you know, in whatever way Professor Taylor prefers because she's the moderator for today. So please raise questions, comments. It's your voice now. And uh, we're very grateful that you're here. And right at the end, Professor Karen Bishop Morris will announce our next event. So, but in the meantime, please raise, raise your questions and comments on today's um, uh, presentations. If you all could um, put your comments in the chat, that would be great. I do have a few questions to start our conversation um, this afternoon. So first question, how does one overcome feelings of legitimate anger and hatred towards the political enemy? Do, Karen, do you want to start? Yeah. So yeah, I can say that um, I think a big part of this, um, and we saw this was sort of King's steps toward nonviolence is um, gathering information and educating oneself and others. So sometimes, um, we think we understand people's reasons why or motivations, and we actually don't have the full picture. So I think there has to be a process of, of education and a willingness to sit down and get to know some of the root causes uh, for the anger or hatred or oppression. I think that's a big step towards. Okay, I'd like to take a shot at that question as well. Eastern religions, because Dalai Lama was Buddhist, Gandhi was a Hindu, typically teach, and I'm sure they're not unique in doing so, that all the passions, you overcome them through a process of sublimation. If you suppress them, they go underground and they show up in other ways. So for example, uh, you know, Freud defined uh, depression in one place as anger driven underground, you know, hidden anger. Um, so anger, but then at the same time, I think, I think it's a misrepresentation uh, to say that just expression removes the anger. That doesn't happen. You, if you're an angry person, you can go and punch a bag 10 million times a day and your anger will only increase, it will not go away. So the right method is sublimation, meaning turn it upward towards something higher and it begins to disappear. Uh, just, just like the sexual impulse, how does one overcome it? By sublimating it, not neither repressing it nor expressing it, but sublimating it. And I think political movements and revolutions are a great way of sublimating anger because you're redirecting anger that's already in your heart to the world, if the cause is worthy. That's the great qualifier. If the cause is worthy, then you're turning it upwards towards that worthy cause. And as a result, you are then um, overcoming that anger. Um, and that depends on the individual. So the next question is, these principles of peace sacrifice their whole lives for the cause they champion. Usually, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But Gandhi and King exemplified and demonstrated nonviolence, yet they were assassinated. This means they sacrificed themselves, even in death. What does this say about divine justice? Why would a good God allow a prince of peace to be assassinated? Wow, that's a deep question. Well, I'll take a I'll take a stab. So that question reminds me of folks who say, um, you know, just in general, why, you know, why does God allow there to be cancer? Why does God allow children, you know, to to suffer or to to be hungry or to die, homelessness, all of these sort of um, challenges that we face in society? And I think again, understanding the uh, religious undertone and influence and uh, actually anchor that religion was, even though Mandela never spoke about religion in his politics, he was a Christian. And so I think, uh, you know, we know from Christianity at any point that uh, God uses suffering to draw us closer to Christ. And so sometimes the suffering, the suffer, even in the suffering, um, there is redemption and, and reconciliation. And so that would be my, my response. Okay, so I think this has to do with what 
theologians call the problem of evil. You know, God is omnipotent and all powerful and all merciful, and yet he allows evil. Why? You know, and Augustine answers this by saying, because God and God alone can bring good out of evil. <clears throat> and so, um, and he gives the example of the crucifixion of Christ as the greatest evil possible, out of which comes the greatest good. So that would be one way of answering this. The second way, frankly, I feel like some things are mysteries and cannot be answered. They're mysteries that human beings will always try and fathom, but will never come to a complete answer. And for me, that's what it is right now. The sheer injustice that a great soul like Gandhi was assassinated, not by the British, but by a Hindu fanatic who is, you know, who thought Gandhi was giving away too much to the Muslims. And so uh, the tragedy of it, I mean, tragedy, this is tragedy, uh, the enormity of tragedy, you know, why does it even happen? I get, I get sort of silenced by, by the, you know, the up sheer, you know, how painful this, this situation is. So I really, personally, I don't have an answer. I'm not mature enough, but I, I do understand that it has to do with the problem of evil. So we have a, a comment in the chat. Um, can someone really be described as a prince of peace when they are neutral to extreme violence? I'm referring to the Dalai Lama's silence on the invasion of Iraq, which has resulted in the deaths of nearly 1 million people. Also, he was neutral even after the Abu Jayid images emerged. Years later, he spoke out against it, but that moment was a critical one use the voice of peace and nonviolence. So I'm not really sure if this is a question, but perhaps you all can address the comment. Yeah, um, Karen, do you want to address this or you want me to? You know, I would say a couple of things, I guess. And that is, I, I think, first of all, thank you for the, for the question and the comment. It's, it's a very provocative one, but I, I would first say that, you know, princes of peace, but not infallible, they are human. And I think, um, one thing that we learn from all of their lives is that they all, again, had the capacity to change and they all evolved um, and sometimes even flip-flopped uh, positions. Um, not to say that and, and, uh, the Dalai Lama would not have wanted to speak out, but I do think there is value in what Mandela called playing the long game and knowing when to speak and when one could be most mm -hmm. effective. Um, uh, so, uh, I, and, and King was this way too. They they really held that sometimes it was best to withhold, but that that even in that withholding, that wasn't passive or or neutral, but more strategic. And they all talked about strategy versus tactics. So I, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but um, I, I would remind us um, of those takeaways that we can take from their lives. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with what you just said, Karen. And I would, if I have to add, I would just say that unlike the ordinary activist, uh, great activists like these have what um, religion would call right speech, you know, saying what needs to be said at the right moment. Um, and, and so they can see more than you and I can. And so they're more objective in that sense. And they know when to speak up and when not to speak up. Um, we don't know what he was thinking about these. I mean, he's a votary of human rights, so it's in, in, impossible that he would actually support that kind of violence, but not all his views are popular. So when he says Europe is for Europeans, some people freak out at that, you know, but he's, he's, a, he's a defender of humanity, not of Tibetan people alone. So he's looking at, he doesn't see Europe as colonial power or, or, you know, he's not anti-Western and I'm sure he feels similarly about the Chinese people themselves. So I think somebody who comes from a human rights perspective will always sound a little different from the ordinary activist. Right. Okay, so there, there is a follow-up comment here. It said that King had the courage to speak out against Vietnam at the moment it mattered. Mm -hmm. So the, the question now is, is posed juxtaposing. So if I can quickly address that, mm -hmm. What, when you say at the moment that it mattered, that's how it seems to you and me, perhaps. But again, the perspective of these princes of peace is more objective is what I'm trying to suggest. And no two people are the same. And besides their subjectivities, they're also different in their situations. And when one person can speak up, I know it's frustrating to us when a great luminary of peace does not speak up when a great injustice is happening, but they know why they're not speaking up. And the Dalai Lama is very disinterested 
in regional politics or personal gain or anything like that. So, so I wouldn't judge him on this. I think it's not a matter of lack of courage. It's more like Karen said, a matter of strategy rather than ethical strategy, rather than tactics. Right. And if I could make the parallel to just, you know, leadership in general, I mean, it, we don't always understand some of the reasons why or the timing of things. We can't, you know, assume that we are privy to all of the sort of the constellation of factors that go into uh, people making decisions when and how they do. Um, but I would just underscore what um, Deepa said that absolutely it, it has nothing to do with the lack of, of courage, I would say. And if I can add just one quick thing, I think leaders are also couriers of history. And I mean, someone like Joe Biden's sudden pull out of, out of um, Afghanistan, I don't think was just his decision, but was meant to be, was something that was sort of fated in a way. Uh, you and I may not like it. It should have been planned much better, we might say. But I think great leaders understand that not everything is in human hands and history has its own logic. Okay, I believe we have time for one more question. Can you forgive or is there forgiveness without love? <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, I think that, well, what kind of love are, um, are we talking about? I think if we're talking about, um, you know, the kind of love that is the kind of love that King and Gandhi are drawing on when they are defining nonviolence, I think you can. Um, I think um, it can be a choice. You know, Mandela also felt that courage was a choice. And he often spoke about uh, feeling um, maybe not so brave in situations where he exhibited great bravery, but he thought courage wasn't about the big heroic acts, but it was about the daily sort of attention to doing the thing and pushing ourselves to do the thing, the right thing or the ethical thing. So um, I guess I can kind of equate forgiveness in that same way with that uh, value of courage. You know, it's sometimes about making the, the better choice for the, for the greater good. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. So I think forgiveness is is a kind of love, and so the two are combined. But it's 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 more it's stronger to love the enemy than to than to just um, than to just forgive. So I see love for the enemy as something stronger than forgiving the enemy. So we're out of time now, I guess. And um, Karen, you have to announce the next event, right? I do. So if you would permit me to share screen and just thank you all for attending today and thank you for the wonderful questions. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for moderating. On November 30th, also a Tuesday, same time, same Zoom room, also synchronous, 1230 to 145. We will have Professor of Sociology and uh, also affiliated with the Center for Global Studies, Dr. Alan Spector, who's speaking on who is hurt by racism. You might be surprised to find out. So please join us on Tuesday, November 30th, 1230 to 145, same channel, same time. Thank you all for being with us today. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your thank you notes in the chat. Very, very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you.